there we go. So we're recording this event and um, that will be up on our YouTube channel. So you will be able to relive the experience. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful Fiona Steger. Um, Fiona owns and works at the Avid Reader Bookshop. She has been a literary judge for many, many different awards, including the Stella Prize. Uh, and she was also the president for many years of the Australian Booksellers Association. Um, and she is also our wonderful Lord and Master at Avid Reader and we adore her. So everybody, <laughs> welcome Fiona Stakes. Uh, thank you so much, Chrissy, And uh, congratulations to Chrissy Neen, who has been shortlisted as the, uh, for one of the um, Australian Booksellers Association Awards as Bookseller of the Year. So well done, Chrissy Neen. Thank you. Um, so I'm just thrilled to be doing this uh, interview with Sajata Massey. Uh, Sajada is the author of 14 novels, two novellas and numerous short stories that have been published in 18 countries. Her novels have won the Agatha, Lefty and McCavity Awards and she's been a finalist for the Edgar, Anthony and the Mary Higgins Clark Prizes, all the prizes if you're a, a crime and mystery writer. So we're here to talk about her latest two novels, um, a murder at Malabar Hill and the set of her Moonstone. And both these novels are set in the 1920s India, and I can't wait to go back to that um, period with Sajata. So Sajata was born in England, parents from India and Germany. She's raised primarily in St. Paul, Minnesota, although for, for the last 30 years, her home has been Baltimore, Maryland. So please, everybody, welcome Sajata. Um, so, um, Sajada, I just want to ask you, what's, what's um, lockdown been like for you in um, Baltimore? What's, what's your life been like for the last 8, 10, 12 weeks? Yeah, oh, hi, everybody. It's, it's, uh, first of all, I want to say, if we didn't have the coronavirus epidemic, I would not be Zooming with you. Because this, this whole business of booksellers and authors and readers connect and librarians connecting together, it just didn't exist four months ago. So, you know, it's, that's the silver lining of, yeah. of, the, of the epidemic. Um, my, the state I live in is not very badly affected. It's affected, but not, at, it's not like a hot spot. So, um, you know, I, I think that our, our lives have changed. I still stay home and I do a lot of gardening and walking. So it's not like I'm in a small place. Um, and I've found all these new ways to live. So it's been very interesting for me. I'm, I'm quite worried about a lot of people and some of my friends have gotten a COVID and some of my friends, family members have passed. So there's like a really serious edge behind everything. And I think a lot about what it would have been like during the polio time, the period when everyone had polio. Um, you know, just these things that we hear about are happening and then we move on and we have, you know, so that, that is a little bit of comfort to me that I believe we will move on. My, my 18 year old son doesn't believe we will, but <laughs> you know, it just, it's such a big shock for, for people. I think especially for younger people, I think it must be such, because their lives have been so greatly disrupted, especially at that age with terms of travel or uni or work. So mm -hmm. I, I really feel for, for, for young people with this whole thing and, and coupled with climate change, I think it, it must feel a bit grim for them in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's but anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> let, let's move to um, your your um, novels. So, as I said, you've written a lot over quite a period of time. Um, Sajada, when did you decide you wanted to be a writer? Well, I think that somehow it was decided for me. <laughs> um, you know, when I, I grew up as a little girl, I, I just was in love with books from the very early stages. Um, I was actually born in, in England my parents, my, my mother's from Germany, my father is from India. And so that was like a very big influence in my early years, being in England, even though I wasn't an English person. And so 
my early childhood was filled with a lot of really good quality children's books from England. You know, old classics from turn of the century, like Frances Hodgson Burnett. And then I was reading all the Noel Stratfield books and the Enid Blyton books and Nina Aiken. And it, I mean, it was just an incredible, there's just such a, a wealth there. And that was my escape actually. Because when we moved to the United States, I didn't like it as well as what my memories of England were. I, who knows, um, you know, because I think that a lot of things worked out very well for my family coming here. But as a child, I always felt like I belonged to another place. And so I started writing stories maybe when I was in first grade because I would be sitting idly in class and the, you know, when the teacher was teaching the other kids and I was, I understood. So I would start writing. So I, I've been writing for a long time, but I, I didn't know I wanted to um, be a novelist for a long time. After um, university, I went to work as a journalist because I didn't believe that I would be published. You know, I didn't think I had much to say when I was 22. And that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> and why mystery? What attracted you to the mystery genre? Well, I had been trained at it, on the university level. I was in a program called the Writing Seminars at, at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And that's like a creative writing major. Um, but it was very, very literary. Um, it was... It was like a tense education, is how I would put it, because most of the professors were literary novelists and poets and terribly serious. And the goal was for you to work on something and it, it, it just would really hurt to create that thing. And then maybe you could sell it to a little magazine, you know, or it would be published there for free. But something very exciting happened during my junior year they had a visiting faculty teaching detective fiction and that was the author martha grimes i don't know if anyone has heard of martha grimes okay good oh yeah so an american woman who writes mysteries set in their police procedurals set in modern britain but they have a very old-fashioned feeling to them Detective Inspector Richard Jury is her um, protagonist. And so she, she was telling us, well, first of all, she was encouraging us to write. And we were being told, oh yeah, you just start writing a novel. And, you know, we couldn't do that in the correct, you know, literary the writing seminars. It's like, it was all about short stories. But she was like, well, why wouldn't you start writing a novel? Or why wouldn't you write a mystery short story? And just give me what you've got. And, and she also told us that she made a living. And that was, a, that was a good one too. She told us she made a living. She was on the New York Times bestseller list while, while she was teaching us. So it's pretty incredible that she was teaching us. And so I, I realized I love to read mysteries. And I thought when I want to write, when I am going to try to write for myself, and that was what happened is I, when I was a young bride, I moved with my husband to Japan while he was in the Navy. And so I had all this time on my hands. And so I started writing fiction. But I thought, why don't I write something that I really want to enjoy reading and not worry about the little magazines? So, so there you go. <laughs> well, well done. I'm pleased. I'm pleased that Martha Grimes was one of your visiting lecturers. Um, so we're going to talk mostly about um, your new series set in 1920s in Bombay. And it features the most wonderful character, Paveen Mystery. Can you introduce the audience to Paveen Mystery? Yes, um, so per Paveen Mystery, the heroine of, of these novels, is a 23-year-old woman lawyer in Bombay. And she is the first woman solicitor in that city. And she has to work at a, at a law firm with her father, her father's own firm, because nobody else would possibly hire a woman to work. And she is always trying to please her father because she realizes that if she does something that embarrasses him and makes trouble for the firm, that 
you know, she'll lose her job and it's all over. So she can't be quite as bold and reckless as you would see a heroine being in a modern mystery novel. Uh, however, what she is doing is, is quite out there, you know, that she is, she is, she is being quite brave. And the, the one thing that she does is she, that she can do that no one else can do is she can get to women in trouble. Um, because there were communities in India where women lived in seclusion and for religious and other cultural reasons, they could only, um, you know, chat with men in their immediate family, like their, their husband or their, you know, or father, and that they lived in Zanana, they lived in Purda. And, and because she's a woman, she can go. And there were so many different, um, legal situations for mm -hmm. women according to their religion that she needed to learn about all these different kinds of law and she can help them in different ways. It's just fascinating how you've done that. And um, Praveen is also um, from Aparsi, from the Zoroastrian community. Can, yes. That was something I didn't know anything about. Can you, can you tell us about Parsi and the Zoroastrian people? Yeah, and you know, I think you have a number of Parsis in Australia and New Zealand. I really do. That I think that that was an emigration spot. Um, Canada also. Um, so there is a very small religious community worldwide. Right now it only numbers like maybe 50,000 in India. Um, and they are, the, the Zoroastrian is a, is a faith that it's pre-Christian uh, faith very, very old, and it originated in the Middle East, and there were a lot of Zoroastrians in Persia. And when, um, when Persia became an, an Islamic country, um, then they were facing some persecution. So a number of them boarded uh, boats and sailed to India. And they landed there and they asked permission to stay and live. And they promised that they would never convert anyone. That was like a law. And it's still to this day. And that's why people can't join the faith or convert because of the, this old law. Mm -hmm. um, and they began speaking Gujarati. That became their language of use in India. And so they began arriving Probably the earliest ones were around the 8th century um, that they began arriving in India. And then there was a, so there was an early group of immigrants, and that's where uh, my heroine's family is from, like a really, really old. And this, and a number of these um, Parsis were invited by the British colonials to build Bombay when, when the British got Bombay as a wedding gift from the Portuguese. And so it was just a fort at that time, just a small military fort. And so the Parsis came and they built this wall to protect that fort. And then they, they kept on, they built all these buildings. And in fact, the name for, for builder in the sort of the Parsi parlance is, is mystery. And so that is so her, because her family has a building heritage, that's her last name. But of course, I had to think when I realized that I could write a mystery series about someone and give her the last name mystery, <laughs> I, had, I couldn't resist. You know, I could have named her lawyer because that is a, the, a lot of Zoroastrian surnames are trade names like contractor, lawyer, uh, banker. I mean, literally the English name is that that is the, the um, surname. But there also are Indian names that reflect the work, and I really love that name, Mystery. And of oh, course, was, Rohinton Mystery is a very famous. Yes, uh, yes, yes. It's such a it's a, such a lovely twist to it all. Um, so, um, who, did somebody inspire Praveen? Like, where where did she come from? Yeah. And well, I knew that I wanted to write um, a legal series after having written my first series, which. Is, which was set in modern Japan. Um, I, I knew that I loved exploring kind of tra translating cultures as a little bit, um, sharing cultures, I guess is a better way of saying, think, sharing what I love, what I enjoy. Um, 
so I knew I wanted to do something set in India. I knew I wanted it to be historic because I'd read, I'd written a historic standalone already and I'd done a ton of research and I just loved that era. And I knew that there were a lot of strong women at that time. So I needed a woman that could actually have some reason to come near the dead bodies. So I made her a lawyer and she, and it turned out I wouldn't have done it if I didn't know there were already two women lawyers in India. There was one that began practicing in the 1890s through the early 30s. Her name's Cornelia Sarabji, and she was the first solicitor in the British Empire. Ooh, dogs barking. Um, I, hope that, I hope that doesn't bother you too much. Somebody must have walked by. And then the second, there is a second lawyer too, who was the first barrister. And she began working around 1923. And both of them were involved in feminist issues. Um, for example, trying to just have women have more, um, you know, better education and safety if they were in dangerous situations and just all kinds of progressive things. And in fact, the second one, Mithan Tata Lam, was able to reform divorce law, which was a huge, huge issue. If anybody's read the first book, um, it's, you know, you will find that the laws about divor divorce were very different for people and it was very difficult to get divorced if you're a Parsi. So those are the, those are the inspirations, those two mm -hmm. ladies. And they left memoirs, so I'm really, really grateful um, and there's a lot of good biographies. And I think that in the back of my book, there's a list of suggested reading um, where I, I suggest things for people to read further. And so there's biography and memoir. What other kind of research did you do to really, because it's like with both books, I could really walk through the streets. I could smell the smells. I could see everything and feel it all. What kind of research did you do? Well, I love to go to, I love to go to Mumbai as Bombay is called now. And um, my stepfather's family is based there. So I've had a really wonderful introduction to the city with, you know, people that have lived there a long time though they're not Parsi. Um, and so I, what I do is I travel there and I made a number of Parsi connections before I went the first time. And so, and since that, then it's blossomed. And so now I have just people that I regularly see there that they might be professors, they might be, you know, something with the police, they might be uh, connected with, um, medicine, you know, like say Ayurvedic medicine, it might be somebody connected with clothing, you know, I love all that. And uh, someone connected with film. I just, I just kind of, um, try to, to be open. And I, I just, I ask people if they're willing to, to speak with me and I've been really fortunate. Um, and because you said um, that um, the Parsis kind of built um, Bombay and um, Paveen's brother joins the family construction company. And I felt like buildings play such an important part in both novels. So whether it's the widow's house, um, the palace and the lodge, even where Paveen practices law, um, and the menstruating room is also an important kind of um, physical construction that you've made in the book. I did actually want to ask, are you a frustrated architect? Because <laughs> I've, got, I've got a sense that you really thought very much about um, yeah. the physical rooms and the houses. Um, is, am I right? Did you ever want to be an architect or is it just what you use to build the devices? I have to constantly find um, books to, to use the proper words. Like today I wanted to, I was looking for a word for the piece of wood that would be above a window and it turns out, and I said, I think it's lintel, but I'm not 100% sure and it was lintel. So I, I have to look for those things. But what I am is I am an old house lover. 
Um, I live at an 1897 Victorian. I had another house that was, you know, maybe an 1893. I lived in a house that was a 1913. So I only, I grew up in a house that was from the 1930s. So I just love houses. I, I, I mean, I love them. I love them the way I'm trying to think just, it's like, it's like my hobby. My hobby is dreaming about houses, fixing houses, visiting museums, <laughs> visiting historic houses. It's just, it's like my passion. So you caught that. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. And also another strong theme is food. So I do need to ask you about um, the role of food through both novels. Yes. Oh, I, well, I love to cook. I love to eat. Um, I grew up with both my parents cooking a lot of delicious Indian food. So I, and then I started cooking it myself when I moved away to go to university. And uh, so it's just like, it's, it's, it's one of the things that made the um, pandemic a, a lot better for me is that I could focus on feeding feeding my family and finding food and finding it in different ways without going to a grocery store so it's like because I'm so into food that I love the puzzle of how are we going to have all these meals when there are no salad greens well, answer there are dandelions in my yard <laughs> so I love I love it and um I, one of the ways that I, the, the Parsi food is a bit different from Indian food that's typically served in restaurants. It has many, many, many more spices. Um, there's a lot of use of eggs. Um, there is a love of fish, um, a lot of fish. Well, they eat meat a lot too, which, you know, that it, just in different ways. Um, so there are great, great, Parsi cookbooks. And I also connected with a Parsi food blogger who's also a caterer. And she's helped me so much with things like the wedding menu. Um, there's different foods for funerals. Like I have to check out that that's absolutely right that I have that um, for, this, for a book that I'm working on right now. Um, and usually when I'm writing these books, I start, I might make things while I'm working you know I might be starting to cook the food that's in the book but on a limited amount just because I, I'm in that world <laughs> lovely and for um for people uh, watching today you can go to Sajada's um website and there are some recipes there and also um I loved your um, Pinterest board that you've got where you've got lots of photographs of everything from textiles right through. So I also recommend people um, dive into that too, just to see some of the background to, to the books. Um, so back to the first novel, we've got Paveen. Um, and I did, I don't want to give any spoilers, but I do want to ask you um, about the menstruation room, because I think for a lot of people who have read it, when um, Paveen finds herself in this space, it's, it's a shock to her and it was also a shock to me. Can you just kind of give us a little bit of a background to what these menstruation rooms um, were for and who used them? So there, um, there was a, a belief in traditional Zoroastrianism that women were unclean when they're menstruating. And, you know, also it's, the same in Judaism, you know, we're very orthodox that women are separated, but the Parsis took it a step further that they, in the old, old, old days, the women would go to another building, like in the village. But then people had a, ha a room in their house and the, the bed there, it would just be metal. It would be no mattress because you could soil a mattress and there'd be like a tin cup and a tin plate. I mean, it, it was literally everything you would hear about a prison. It was like that. Though there are there are different aspects. Like I have talked to some older Parsi women that have said, "Well, you know, when we went there, that meant we didn't have to do childcare 
or cleaning. So we, we took it like that those ladies just took it in a different way. Um, but for somebody like Praveen, who's been very independent and, you know, she is ex excited, you know, wants to spend time with her husband, you know, she can't believe this. And he never told her this was coming. I mean, she knew her, the parents were old fashioned, but it, and, and so there was a whole mix of some people were doing it. Some people weren't doing it in India and the most liberal Parsis were in Bombay, which is where her family is. And I, I think that this tradition died out in the fifties and sixties. I don't, I haven't heard of it, anybody doing this anymore, but you would be there for about 14 days. Uh, no, no, let me think. I'll tell you what it was. It was, you'd be there the whole time. And then after you stopped any type of bleeding, you had to wait like a couple more days and then you could go out. So it was quite a bit of time. It was probably at least 10 days. Yeah, and it's just one of the many fascinating um, religious um, aspects that you look at in both of the books. Um, for me, it was an interesting time that you're looking at where religions seem to coexist more harmoniously than at other times. Is, is, is that part of the reason that you were attracted to doing writing in the 1920s? I, it's just a really, it, it, it's such a special time. Um, like, I don't think about it as like people doing the jitterbug or anything like that. Or it, I, I think about it um, being this time that the colonial um, rule was, it, you know, people were really chafing against it. And it was the start of the freedom movement in India, not the start start. That was in the 19th century, but it was really crystallizing around uh, Mahatma Gandhi so there's a great political story I can tell um, with my book. Mm. And, and then there was also the reality of women entering the professions, which was exciting. So, you know, for a long time, the Indians, they just wanted to have dominion status because they said, Australia has dominion status. Why can't we be a dominion also? I mean, that was originally like my family background in India, my, um, you know, great, great, great uncle was the founder of the Congress Party, which is this political party that really moved. It was the first big, big party that, um, you know, got things going in India and they were very active in the freedom movement. But he, in, in late Victorian Calcutta, he really wanted just to be a dominion. He didn't think the British should leave. He thought that there could be, that there were very positive things about the British, but they just needed to change. They just needed to change the way they operated. Um, and so it's, it's, it's rich in that kind of um, political history, but also the legal history as well, where we've got Paveen who has to work on two um, separate cases that are very much based in law. How did you go about researching the legal detail that, that imbues uh, both books? Yeah, the, the, oh, I just, before I even answer that, I wanted to ask, I don't see anybody's questions in chat. So I don't know if folks are enabled to, to leave their question in chat or if anybody's no. trying to. <laughs> coming straight to me Sujata so I have oh, a lot of later. okay 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 I'm just making myself crazy okay so <laughs> the way I do the legal, this is how to write a legal mystery if you're not a lawyer um, I, I discovered a wonderful um, academic book which was the history of law in colonial India and it really focused a lot on Parsis because they made up a third of the law for law, um, the law community, even though they were only 6% of the population. Mm -hmm. So they were really, that was just a, a, a very favored thing. So I, I read this amazing book and then I got in touch with the author of the book and she has been extremely kind. And when I write these, I talk through ideas with her first and she sends me a a lot of documentation that I wouldn't have known about that leads me different ways. 
And then I share the book with her at the end um, to see that I haven't screwed things up too badly. The other thing I do is I was delighted to find that there are some legal texts from those days that have been scanned by university libraries. So I can read the entire thing online. Now, because I discovered that um, this inheritance law was so different, and like, for example, with, um, you know, Muslim women that they could only get, you know, like they get a third of the estate if there's one of them, but if there's three of them, they wind up getting a 12th and, you know, it's just like very complicated and a boy gets more than a girl. And I got really interested in that. And I thought, oh, that would be a really good case. Like, let me look into the inheritance law. And then from the other book, the one by Mitra Sharafi, which was a history, I learned about the different divorce laws for the different communities. And I said, oh, I'm going to do something with Perveen and her relationship to make this personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful. Um, and there's also a host of other wonderful side characters as well. Um, so we have Alice. Would you introduce us to, to Alice, who um, certainly features in, in the first novel, A Murder at Malabar Hill? Yeah, okay. So uh, in order to become a lawyer, Perveen wound up going to be educated at Oxford. And she was a student at, well, she was at St. Hilda's Hall, St. Hilda's College. And she met another English woman on the way over, Alice Hobson Jones, who comes from, uh, her, her father is very high ranking in the colonial government in Bombay. And Alice is a real rebel. Um, she's not straight. And, you know, her family found out and, um, I don't want to give away all the things, but she, so she can't live the life that they want her to live and she can't talk about it. Um, and Praveen has some black mark on her, her history because of her early failed romance. And so they, they become fast friends and they, they can share these things with each other, but they can't tell other people those things. So they have a wonderful friendship. And Alice Hobson Jones is also a math, you know, a math whiz. And she winds up, she uses like a little bit of math in the first book to help solve that mystery. And then she winds up doing more with math and um, her career in, in forthcoming books. So she's going to be, she's around for quite a while. I love her. I, another one of my favorite characters, I'd say, is... Perveen's father has this law firm and there's a gentleman who answers the door and takes care of everything. And his name is Mustafa and he's a Muslim. He's an ex military man, um, you know, from he's a Punjabi Muslim. And so he's almost like a stand in for like a grandfather figure for Perveen. And there's always a lot of back and forth where he's worried about her. And then of course, you know, I love food. So there's a Parsi bakery across the street and the Parsis were known for having these wonderful restaurants with baked goods and also savory goods. And everybody, regardless of religion, loves to go to these places that they're considered like these ethnic restaurants, you know, like fun ethnic restaurant for everyone. So um, there are a lot of, there's, there's usually a meal in, in that restaurant in most of the books, at least one meal or at least one <laughs> conversation. And in the second novel, The Sadapur Moonstone, um, Pazine has to go into the, um, the mountain area because she has to mm -hmm. act for um, two, um, two uh, like part of the royal family. Um, and she stays at a lodge and she meets um, a British guy called Colin. Can you talk to us a little bit about, about Colin and, and what oh, yeah. Pazine is doing in the mountains? Okay. So um, one of the things I learned about the, that first woman lawyer, Cornelia Sarabji, is that she created a job for herself where she investigated the welfare of women in Porta for the, for the colonial government, because there were wealthy women that were living in seclusion, perhaps in palaces that were being cheated out of their fortunes and whatnot, and problems with children. 
So a woman lawyer could go and look into that. So that's the reason she goes to the mountains. She's on her way to a palace, but she stays at one, one of these incredible historic rest houses that are all over India. Um, they're still all over India and you can still, I mean, if you have a government person can stay in them. So she stays in a place like that. And the person who is in, who, who resides there all the time is a young British civil servant called Colin Sandringham, who's supposed to be attached to that palace and liaising with them and you know making sure everything's all right however they're refusing to see him um in part because he's man and also in part because he has a um no i don't want to tell you what he has but they had reason that they didn't want to see him um but he's a i think he's a lovely character i wasn't sure what i would do with him at the start of the book like how he would turn out um the characters reveal themselves to me as they go along so uh, on that note, are you a, a plotter or um, a pantser? A pantser? <laughs> um, well, I started out as a pantser when I was quite young. I mean, when I was uh, like, yeah, say when I was writing in my teens, when I was writing in my 20s, even when I was writing, say, my first um, early Rachel Moore novels, the earlier series. But what wound up happening is in order to have my publisher agree to give me an advance and publish the next book before I'd written it, they wanted to know what, was it, what it was about naturally. So I started writing, having to write a summary. And usually my summaries were a couple of pages, but the summaries became longer and longer. And so now I would write a, like a synopsis which is probably you know 12 or 15 pages before I write a book. And yes, things change, but in general, I have an idea of where I'm going to go and the kinds of issues I'm gonna talk about. And I like that because if I go off course, I just look at what I'm supposed to be doing. It helps me, it helps me stay on track. And do you keep a visual track because it is so wonderfully intricate? Do you do you have to use a whiteboard or do you use oh, a yeah. too bad we're not a so I have a, I what I do is I write things that need to happen on little cards or it's scraps of paper because right now it's the pandemic and I'm not going to go to a store. And then I tape them on a bulletin board and I can move them around. And that way I can keep track of what's going on chronologically, what's going on perhaps in somebody's relationship story. Cause there's always a story about a family conflict or a romantic conflict or some kind of personal growth. And then there's the main, you know, meat and bones of somebody died. Um, there was a, uh, the police took the body here. This is a clue. You know, that, 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 that whole story goes a lot down the middle. And I didn't invent this. Um, there are, you know, this is the kind of thing that people are talking about a lot. Um, you know, writers are talking about different ways to do it. I'm trying to think who it was that wrote that has really gotten into this, but if anybody, I think you have this organization, Sisters in Crime in Australia, um, and which I belong to. And I, what we, we had somebody presenting, an author from Sisters in Crime presenting about this just the other day. And, you know, she's got a really wonderful plot map. And uh, if I remember her name, I'm on the spot. I'll put it in, I'll put it in the notes. <laughs> Lovely, great. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a one, Sisters in Crime is a wonderful organisation here in Australia. They do literary awards and courses and interviews, and so it's well worth following them on social media. So with, with your characters, so those side characters that we've got, like Alice and maybe even Colin, uh, will, we, will we get to see them again in future um, oh, books? Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So book two is a little bit of a departure because Perveen leaves the city of Bombay to do the special mission up in the mountains. You know, I wanted to be in those mountains and I, I also wanted to do a palace 
mystery because I, well, I, first of all, I love royalty and you know, I love architecture and I stayed in a palace. I went and I did all this palace research. So I had to get that out of the way. Um, but she's back in the city of Bombay in the third book. And Alice is a very big character in that one. Um, and also, I don't want to give away too much, you know, I don't want to ruin the story. No, no, no so, good, good. Yes. A lot of them, pretty much everybody who's in her life comes back, unless it's a thing where it would really maybe spoil your reading. Like, for example, if there was somebody in book two that you thought could be a murderer, and then, you know, I, I, it's just like, I don't want to... I don't want to blow it. Like if you read book four and you find out somebody is a nice and smiley person and then you're reading book two and she's suspicious of them, that's no fun for you. So I have to be careful. But there, there are usually, usually the people that are the support characters that we see over and over. Um, one of what I get asked a lot with it, for example, the first book, A Murder at Malabar Hill is, people fell in love with the children in that book, especially a little girl, Amina, and they said they wanted to see her again. And then in the last book, um, there was a little princess and people wanted to see the little princess again. And so it's like, I, I'm gonna have to have a boarding school for all these little girls. And I always love boarding school novels. So <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do, but you know, there's some, there's some there's some pleas for those people to come back. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love it that like, these characters feel so real to us that like we do want to see them again. We, they are real to us. So well done. I think that's a sign of great writing when, when we really believe in them and we want to see them again. It's very exciting for me that the books are all around the world. So I have readers in Singapore. I have readers in India. I have readers in Finland, um, France, Italy, and it, I, I just never would have dreamed that people would be so interested in India. And, the, you know, and, it, and also they weren't involved in colonialism. Australia, I can completely understand the connection and that the, it's, there's a really strong connection. And did you know that there were, there were a lot of Australians in India during this time and there were and there were also a lot of Australian women who married Indian royalty. Did you know about that? You and did? I, yes, yes. Yes. And there was um I was listening to an interview with an Australian crime writer and um and her great grandmother or great great grandmother um had married into what what we call the White Raj. Yeah, it's quite quite extraordinary. Yes, there's a book by an Australian writer called Wicked Women of the Raj, and it's a nonfiction book. It's a paperback. I just read it. Um, my mother insisted that I read it. And it, 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 expla it explains this kind of crazy world and, and that they would meet in Australia. They would have a lovely, they would meet under these circumstances of luxury and restaurants and beautiful hotels. And then they would go there and it wasn't, and then there would be other wives, of course. Mm -hmm. And so it wouldn't be quite the same thing. And there were women who definitely married for money. There were women who, um, you know, married for, they, they were absolutely enchanted. They were couples that seemed like they were absolutely really in love, but the circumstances of where they lived and the other people putting pressure on them to conform made it difficult. There were couples that wound up just going back to Europe to, or, or somewhere else to live because it was too hard to live the way they wanted. And if they had the money, they could do it. So I, I got a lot out of that. I found it very interesting. Well, maybe, maybe we can ask that there's an Australian character that pops up in one of your forthcoming books. It might like it, be. If, if Paveen can't come <laughs> to Australia, maybe you can have an Australian woman pop up there yeah. and need well, the I legal services. To, I, yes, I, <laughs> I, I am, I'm thinking about it. Like right now it's like, it, it's a possible, it's definitely a possibility for before. 
So, and I have been to Australia before and I enjoyed it very much. Oh. Um, I went in the early 1990s. Um, remember the World War II Battle of the Coral Seas? Mm. And the US Navy in Australia, they, were, they cooperated. So they had an anniversary. I think I was there, it was like the 50th anniversary. And so what the, the men sailed around, like the US Navy, a whole lot of the, the ships from Japan that were based in Japan went to Australia. And then as a spouse, I flew to Australia and I would pop up and visit in these really unusual small seaside places that they went, like Bunbury and Bustleton. Am I pronouncing <laughs> Yeah, right. yeah, perfect. perfect. But I mean, yes. And you know, it was it was just Perth. We went to Perth. You know, that was a high point. Um, <laughs> and I went to Sydney. So I know there's a lot more I want to see. And of course, mm. I love the Miss Fisher's mysteries. Yes, yes, yes. I, I love the books and I love the show. All right. So you know, that is really a very special gift to the world, actually. Yeah. That is a gift to the world from Australia. And it, um, it just sort of raised the profile of Australia in a, in a very unexpected way, yeah. I think. Oh, that's lovely. Well, hopefully we can welcome you to Australia maybe next year or the year after. <laughs> we can introduce so. all of Australia to the wonderful Paveen mystery. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Chrissy, do we have some questions? We do, we have quite a few. I'll just um, see if I can get through a few of them. Um, one of the questions here is from Barbara. Um, do you think that crime fiction can be a privileged space to share culture? Is it because of its popularity that there is something else that makes a vital genre, makes it a vital genre for cultural mediators? So I suppose the idea of sharing culture through crime um, mm. and yeah, is that, is that a privileged space to share culture through crime? Yeah, well, well, a lot of people, it, it turns out that people enjoy mysteries that in different countries. And a lot of it is countries that, that people have visited or they're going to visit. There's, it's, it's something about the process of learning what's behind the, the, the facade. And I think, every, I think we all want that in some way, to learn what people are really like and you know what is not in the tourist brochure so I think that crime fiction set in these countries is a way of like really digging in um and but it's also very entertaining so it's not like a homework of any sort it's like a lot of pleasure so I I think that it's it's a huge thing my publisher in the United States has crime fiction set in maybe 48 countries. It's a huge amount of countries um, that, that these novels are set in. And, you know, that's just their, their forte. And I, I love to read books set in other countries. Mm. That's great. There's a question here from Suzanne who asks, um, what do you think is the future of the Parsi community if intermarriage is forbidden? Do you know how the young people manage to leave the community? Was that part of your research? Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's like, it's a really tricky situation. And I, I do talk to people. I talk to Parsi journalists as well as Parsi families. Um, there's a lot of people marrying out of the community just because it's such a small community. and people also it's um i would say that pro probably financially better off than many people in india um but and that goes back to this incredible inheritance law where money was shared um and there there are just a variety of reasons so people in the parsi community aren't that eager to get married or if they are it's a slim pickings so, you know, like a couple I met, a, a very smart, attractive couple, they wound up meeting at a world youth conference. And I think it was in Australia. I mean, it was like a, they had to leave India and leave the United States to find each other. And so it's, there are, there are voices and even priests in the Parsi community that are advocating for um, allowing 
people to convert that want to marry in. Um, and for example, if you're a man and you take a wife who is, who is a Hindu or another faith, the children are considered Zoroastrian and they can go into the fire temple, but the wife cannot. So it's all, you know, it's, it's a lot of different permutations. Right now it's very small numbers. It, it, it could, the group could, could go the way of Jewish people in India. It's a very, very, very tiny amount of Jewish people in India. There are more Parsis than Jewish people. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'll just have to see what happens. Mm, right. Um, there's a question from Nina, which is about, um, do you speak other languages? Um, and uh, mm -hmm. the idea that language um, affects uh, the way that you write and the way that you think about things. So it, what's, you know, what languages do you speak if you, if you speak any other apart from English? Okay. <laughs> Well, um, I, I speak, I, I feel so, as the older I get, the rustier I get, I feel. But I spoke German quite a lot when I was a child and young person. And when I was in Japan, I studied Japanese and I spoke, you know, I spoke adequate Japanese, but I didn't speak like intellectual Japanese. But I, you know, I spoke, you know, getting around Japanese. And I, I did find it very important. I realized when I was writing those Japanese books that because I, I could speak Japanese and, and started to learn different kinds of idioms and metaphors that I love that. And I thought that's an advantage and that's something I want to bring to my writing. That's what speaking the language first, even in, in a basic way can do. So when it came time to do the Indian series, I started studying Hindi. And, you know, even though my dad is, is Indian, he's a Bengali, he didn't, I didn't grow up with an Indian language in the home because my mom is from Germany and they were both speaking a foreign language, English. Um, so, so it was, I was learning it later and it was, it, it was helpful. Um, but it, I think that, you know, I, w I wish my, my Hindi was, was better than it, than it is. Um, one thing that is really super nice is there are books of proverbs. Like the Parsis have a lot of slang and proverbs, and that so a couple of Parsi. Um, one of them is is a filmmaker, and one of them is is another writer. That they they got together and they created a sort of a whole cataloging of these expressions. And so I turned to that book a lot to look at it when I'm trying to think of things fun to say. Oh, do I hear a bird? A wonderful it's bird. A crow. <laughs> oh, okay. The crows here are very verbal. <laughs> you might want to put a crow in your book if you ever do an Australian book. They're yeah. very, they're very I have a parrot in there. I have a recurring parrot in my book. Excellent. Um, I've got a question here about clothing. Um, so you do such wonderful things with clothing in your books. And um, it's, you know, it gives um, that clothing is such an important cultural marker for, for different cultures. Um, do you do this consciously? Yes. Um, there was a time that I was a fashion reporter. So, uh, you know, I, I enjoy clothing and I, I understand that it means a lot. Clothing means a lot. Um, so I do write about clothing. I write about um, saris that were made out of this homespun khadi cloth that was a sign of political protest. Um, I describe where the, the saris were um, woven and what kind of designs are in the saris. The Parsis had their very own special luxurious saris because they did a lot of trade they in the beginning they did a lot of shipping business importing with china that they asked they went to um seamstresses and embroiderers in china and asked to have things embroidered there so a lot of the part the parsi saris that are antique have a, you know east asian motifs and designs and they have needle pointed borders and things like that. And I just think that's lovely to know about and to share. 
Mm, fantastic. Um, and there's just one more question here about how long it takes you to write one of the novels. Probably a, a little bit more than a year. And that the editing, it's when I, when I turn the book to the, to my editor, I wind up working on it quite a bit more. Um, so it's maybe like 14 or 15 months to get the first thing to her. And then I might work on it for four more months, which sounds like a lot. I'm a lot slower now. And I, I know I'm slower, but, you know, the readers have got to be very understanding. And I appreciate that because I would rather spend a longer time writing a better book. I see you smiling, Chrissy. You're a writer too. Yeah, I am a writer too. Um, and, you know, it takes me a minimum of a year to write a book. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Look, um, it's been absolutely fantastic. It's been a bit of a masterclass in how you um, how you create your work today. Fiona, the questions were amazing. Um, oh, I thank you. Holding up the book. So do you want to talk about the, If you make a noise, we'll be able to see them. Oh, sorry. Um, I put myself on mute because the crows were so loud. Yeah. So I just really want to um, um, thank Sajida, but also really... Um, Spruik the, the values of these two books. So for those people who haven't read them, please dive into this wonderful world that Sajid has created, um, the India of the 1920s. And you too will fall in love with Praveen Mystery. Fantastic. Look, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure to host this event today. Um, I am going, what I'm going to do um, just to finish off is I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves um, and that means oh. we can give um, Sujata a, a great big clap. Um, so be ready. In a second, I'm going to allow you all to unmute yourselves and then we will do a group clap. And then unfortunately, um, without further ado, I'm just going to have to end the meeting. Um, <laughs> so it won't be a formal bye okay. everyone because it'll be just a rabble out there. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, and do purchase those books on that link that I've been sending around um, rapid, rapid fire link sending. Um, we'll be happy to post them out anywhere in Australia or overseas if you would like. So um, thank you very much for the two of you and I hope we get to talk to you again when the next one comes out. Yeah, thank you so much, Chrissy and Fiona. I really enjoyed Bye. it. Thanks everyone thank for you. coming, for getting up on Sunday morning and joining us. <laughs> and now everyone can unmute themselves. So I'm, I've got um, my view. It's going to be for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming too. Thank you for joining us. No, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone.